You and I can do it in one day. I agree with you. So Did hopefully you we'll stimulate some people and they'll go out and study for themselves. You want to just recap, like in in just maybe one minute, what we talked about last last week. We talked about your friend, uh, your friend June. Yes, my friend June. Uh, I'm a state section director for the Mutual UFO Network, and. On the anniversary of the Roswell crash, July 4th, 1997, that was the 50-year anniversary, she called me and told me that she now wanted to go public with her story. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that she worked at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, between 1943 and 1951 as a what would now be called an office manager. She had a Q-level security clearance, and while she was there, she was party to some very extraordinary events and amongst the people where she worked it was common knowledge that there has already been repeated contact with extraterrestrials and that there were not one but three crash retrieval cases that she knew about. Mm -hmm. So so is she, in essence she gave you documents to back this up and um, if we do your slideshow and um, hopefully we have enough time where we could maybe talk about some of the things that she shared with you. That would be could wonderful. Could we do that? Yeah. Be kind of sneaky actually to put, it that, would work really to well. put that on the end. So um, maybe we should do that. Would you like to set us up for, for your show here? Yes, I would. I'd just like to remind everybody, hopefully they saw the first part of this. If they didn't, what we're trying to do here is to show that the universe is a vast and strange and complex thing and there's a lot more going on out there than we ever imagine. So what we're going to do here is we're going to start off with kind of a quick grand tour of the universe and we start off with our own home. We go to our nearest neighbor, the moon, and of course the source of all of our life and energy, our star, Sol, which it turns out that more than half of the main sequence stars in the galaxy are much like our own. And then we're just going to wander around our solar system. Oh, look at Total, that. Exactly. Total eclipse from July 1991. This was the same eclipse where people in Mexico City routinely saw UFOs. I've seen the videotapes. This is broad daylight sightings, uh, military parades, some of the jets that flew over Hundreds of thousands of people were diverted to chase after the UFOs. This is Venus. <coughs> this is Venus as with, with its cloud covering. We move closest to the sun. Mercury viewed from the Mariner 10. And we're just going to keep touring around the solar system. This is a view of an asteroid, Gaspra. As our equipment has gotten better and better, we're able to see further and further into space. The mystery giant planet Jupiter with just a few of its moons. And the most exciting discovery, of course, is Europa, mm -hmm. which they now believe could possibly have volcanic energy source and an ice shell on the outside, allowing some form of life to exist. Trying to get the scale is always difficult. The great red spot on the surface of Jupiter would hold 50 Earths. This shows you that things are not dead out there. You can just see a volcanic eruption on Jupiter's moon Io over the edge of the horizon. This is the most beautiful planet in many ways, the ring planet Saturn with six of its moons, one of Saturn's moons Enceladus. The more we learn, the more we learn that there's more to learn. There's just no end to the mystery like to say something, you know, when we talk about UFOs, a lot of times people don't realize what all is involved here. We talk about planets, we talk about musical sounds, we talk about... Um, a complex event. Yes, and it's not just some unidentified flying object. So. It's not just seeing a disk in the distance. We throw around numbers a lot. This is our home collection of planets, minus Pluto, which is too small and too far out to see. And we talk about billions of things. We talk about billions of dollars, billions of miles, billions of light years even. And 
I want to just explain, we talk about how much is a billion. Let's say there's a billion stars in this particular slide. If we count one star per second and we never quit and we don't ever take a break, we will count a thousand stars in 16.6 .6 minutes. We will count a million stars in 11.57 days. And if we never ever quit, we will get to our first billion in 31.7 years. And out in space, there are 100 billion galaxies visible. There are approximately 100 billion stars per galaxy, like our own. This pinwheel shape is repeated over and over again through the universe. It's an essential shape. Kind of odd that it looks like a UFO. It also looks like a Mandela. It also looks like many other of our most important symbols. There's strong evidence that more than half of the main sequence stars have planets. This is the Pleiades, which is a particular constellation where some people believe some of our extraterrestrial vis visitors originate. If only one out of every million planets has a position and evolutionary conditions like Earth, there are 10 billion planets out there that may be similar to Earth. The Hubble telescope has brought us some of the most extraordinary views. This is why wow. it's great to be alive now. Anyone who can get on the internet can see the deepest views of space. These, interestingly enough, are called star birth clouds. So everything that exists is being born and being dying in an endless cycle. We see all of these grandiose cosmic explosions, galaxies without end, worlds without number. And so we're supposed to assume just because someone tells us that we're all alone and that all of this glory was created just for a species called man. I find that very hard to accept. This is called a dying star. These are just magnificent images when you think that these are millions of light years across. In this particular photograph, we see stars being born and, be and dying. The creation of black holes. Many people believe that black holes may be doorways into other universes, higher dimensions, or there may be wormholes that may rapidly connect us to other parts of the galaxy which seem extraordinarily far by our limited technology. But to a civilization that may have existed for 10 million years, a civilization that may have survived overpopulation, environmental degradation, and its own battle with its weapons technology, to a civilization that survived all of those things and has gone outwards to conquer the stars, these distances may not mean anything at all. Um, I believe if a person gets into my web page, which is usually at the end of the show, um, I believe some of these pictures can be accessed through the, um, the these are the ones from the Hubble, no? Yes, and, yeah, and you can type the, the Hubble onto a search engine, mm -hmm. almost any search engine, and you can get extraordinary information, and all of these can be downloaded. Uh, these color slides are readily available in many places. There's never been a better time to tour the galaxy. Yeah, this, you, excuse me. I'm sorry. Or you can go to my web page and just push uh, what's new on Mars, and I believe it'll jump you right in it. That would be perfect. Yeah, so. This is the most extraordinary slide that I would like to certainly direct everyone's attention to. This is where you take the Hubble telescope, point it into the deepest view of space, and just like a camera lens, you set it on infinity. And every one of those blobs of light is not a star. Those are all galaxies. Oh, my. Exactly. It staggers the imagination. And they have now proven that there are other planets in other star systems. Not that, I think for anyone who's taken a, a look at all of this, you already pretty much know that there are other star systems with other planets. 
and we are not alone. I don't think that's really up for grabs. The question is, have we been contacted? The question is, how long has this been going on? Some people believe it may have gone back way far into our history. But let's get down to a little nuts and bolts ufology. One of the things that we have to be able to do as a UFO researcher is not only to understand what is a UFO, as in something that has a high level of strangeness with a highly credible witness, we also have to be able to know what is not a UFO. And some well-meaning people will report routine astronomical objects as UFOs because they've never really looked at the sky. This is the planet Venus next to the moon. These are airliner headlights seen from a distance. This, of course, mm -hmm. is a big annoyance. Mm -hmm. This is a hoax. This is a UFO you can make in your backyard. That's a flying peanut butter jar lid. This is an extraordinary photograph. A woman took this in broad daylight of a meteorite coming down. I would just like to point out this is the difficulty of UFO photographs. Having a camera, being in the right place at the right time, and knowing what to shoot. This is a newspaper article. The Air Force lied in 50s UFO explanation to keep spy planes, a secret study says, now made public. Military deceived the public about UFOs. This whole thing is hysterical because from a perspective of a criminal investigator, I've been around a lot of courtrooms and have testified many times, and one of the things that a defendant should never ever do is to tell the prosecutor or the police, well, I told a lie, but I don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Because the obvious question falls out of it, when did you stop lying? The other problem with this is, the spy planes that they're, they're now identifying as the UFOs that people saw in the 50s or 60s, they can't hover, they, don't, they can't do right angle turns, and what is a spy plane after all? It's a plane that's designed to fly so high and so fast that no one can see it or know that it's there. So are they now admitting that their spy planes didn't do a very good job and all the UFOs that all the people saw were actually their spy planes? Now, of course, this is a stealth bomber, and it does have a rather <coughs> extraordinary shape if you look at it from an end view, and it's possible that if you saw one of these, you might mistake it for a UFO. In fact, here's one of those mysterious UFOs from Mexico City. So you can see how there might be a similarity, except that this UFO can hover for long periods of time. It makes absolutely no noise, and when it wants to, it can accelerate out of view so fast that it looks like it was never there to begin with. I've seen him do flips. I've seen him dematerialize and play with you. It's, uh, it's incredible. And I, I think I've seen it's it because they're, they're hyperdimensional. Yeah. Now, here is the one aircraft that can take off and land vertically. Mm -hmm. This is a Harrier jump jet. Now, the problem with this is if you were anywhere near a Harrier jump jet, when it was landing or taking off, you would know it because it would deafen you. Mm -hmm. It has a tremendous ground effect and those jets scream. This is a diagram, it's hard to see, but this is a aircraft uh, called a hypersonic pulse jet, otherwise known as the Aurora. This just shows you how UFOs are in the news. There's a friend of mine, Peter Davenport. Oh yeah, I recognize him, he's a friend of mine too. Yes he is. Not that, yeah. He's a, a great boon to the UFO community. He runs the National UFO Reporting Center in Seattle and does it on a shoestring budget. He's one of the most dedicated people that I know. This shows you how our friends are out mm -hmm. there everywhere. In fact, I just saw a very cute Volkswagen commercial about UFOs. Technology so advanced it will help answer some big questions. This is a photo that shows where it all began back in Roswell this is where the big cover-up started. At first they published a newspaper story and said that they had captured a disc. And then they changed their story within 24 hours once word got back to Washington. And they put together a press release of these two gentlemen holding up a bunch of old uh, torn up weather balloons and whatnot. This is not the material that the witnesses reported seeing. And this is not the material, a piece of which my friend June got mm -hmm. to hold. 
This was the government records, the GAO, Government Accounting Office, results of a search for records concerning the 1947 crash in Roswell, Mexico. This is an important book, Blank Check, talks all about black budget spending. A man named J. Allen Hynek invented the encounter system. This is for anybody who wants to learn a little basic ufology. There are nocturnal lights, daylight discs, radar visual sightings, a close encounter of the first kind is an observation of a UFO at 500 feet or less. Close encounter of the second kind is the same type of encounter as the first one, only there is some kind of physical trace. This can be ground depressions, branches broke, residual radiation, electromagnetic interference, uh, changes in soil composition, unusual uh, changes in soil chemistry resulting in bacteriological infestation, any number of things. The, the kind I run into. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And the way that you and I met when we talked about the koi fish, that I took that to be a close encounter of the second kind. It makes your hair fall out. I, I would like to mention that. That's true. I remember <laughs> you showed me that too. <laughs> yeah. And then of course, close encounter of the third kind, which is where they got the title for the famous movie. Yeah. And that's where you not only get to see the UFO, but you get to see the driver. And then there's a new one, which, of course, Mr. Hynek didn't quite get around to, but we all use this common terminology, is close encounter of the fourth kind, and these are abduction events. And that's where you get all of the above, plus you get to go with the driver, even though you don't want to. I want to mention a comrade of mine. This is an important sighting. A man named Deputy Dale Spower. He was kind of a martyr to the cause. April 17, 1966, 5.05 a.m. on Route 224 out of Portage County, Ohio, Deputy Dale Spower saw a craft that was like a glowing football cut in half, as big as a house, and he was involved in one of the most extraordinary high-speed pursuits of all time. That's Deputy Dale Spower right in the middle. And the reason that he's important is that he would not back down and wouldn't change his story. And he stood up to a man from Project Blue Book, a major Quintanilla, and he just kind of, without even bothering to investigate what all these police officers had seen and what numerous civilians had seen and all of the excellent circumstances, including the fact that the man on the left in this picture took a picture of a UFO within 24 hours of the deputy sighting that looks almost exactly like what he described, despite all of the evidence to the contrary, he said that perhaps the deputy was having a nervous breakdown. And the public wasn't as tolerant back then as they are now. Yes, yeah, things are really changing, and we exactly. were really kind of glad about that. You and know, Deputy we... Spower was forced out of his job. He had a nervous breakdown. His wife left him, and the last that anybody heard of him he was doing odd jobs. And I have been trying to find out whatever happened to Deputy Dale Spower. That's another thing. If anyone who watches this show knows what happened to this poor man, I would like to write the definitive final tribute to him. This is a famous sighting case from McMinnville, Oregon. And one of the interesting things here is that several years later, the same craft was seen near Rouen, France, and another photograph was taken of almost the same thing. This is not the greatest print, but the UFO appears in the upper part of the photograph. Pro even Project Blue Book, which was highly skeptical, said this was one of the UFOs they were unable to dismiss. This just shows you how you analyze a UFO photograph. You may take uh, solarized pictures, assign mm -hmm. color values, look for strings, paste-ups, and of course with computer technology, Admittedly, the possibilities of fakes are even greater. This is a UFO shot from a South American research vessel with a close-up insert, January 16, 1958, near the island of Trinidad. This is a UFO from Brazil. Oh my. Exactly. One of the important things to consider is that people do not just see classic saucers. 
Exactly. Yeah, they I, see many types of craft. I have pictures of cigar-shaped crafts that we took uh, in Utah. Yeah. The triangles are a very mysterious and important part of the UFO scene in this day and age. People are also reporting acorn-shaped craft. Yeah, the, the, the cigar-shaped one, you see it there? Exactly. Yeah, and we, we got that in the daytime, by the way, <laughs> accidentally. This is an artist's representation of an event that occurred in the Midwest. The glowing fireball cases, which conceivably could be some sort of natural phenomena, they may range in size from six inches to 300 feet across. An artist's representation of an important sighting case from Wodonga, Australia. A cigar-shaped craft from Woodenville, Washington. A photograph of a UFO taken by a narcotics officer, Carlos Diaz, in Mexico. A dome disc craft from New Mexico. A UFO photo in Japan. These are blow-ups of much lar larger photos showing you the most important part of the picture. This is a f UFO that showed up in a photograph taken in the 60s near Vancouver Island. This is still another UFO from Mexico. I want to mention here a friend of mine, an FBI agent, and he told me about his brother who was a United Airlines pilot who had an encounter almost exactly like this while he was on a domestic flight over the United States under ideal weather conditions. And the brother calls his FBI agent brother and tells him this whole story. And he talks about the fact that when they landed, of course, the passengers, they went in 200 different directions. The pilot and the flight crew were called into an office. There was someone from the management and someone from a government agency who flashed his credentials very briefly. And when the pilot left the office, he wasn't quite sure what the guy had said about where they worked. And the man from the airline administration said very simply, you want your job, you want your pension. It didn't happen. Um, I know of a case where one of these crafts flew really close by the, um, the supersonic plane. The SST, right. Uh, yes, and somebody has that film in... in People That's an extraordinary film clip. It happens so fast. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure who owns the rights to that, but I have seen that. And also the Concorde had several things flying next to him, and that was captured on film. This is a very important UFO type because these things are being seen on almost a daily basis somewhere in the world. They're exceedingly mysterious. They're called black triangles. They can be anywhere up to three football fields across. Characteristically, they have lights at each corner. They are very, very quiet, possibly with an electrical hum. They have been seen just about everywhere, and they move in silently and slowly, and they don't seem really particular about being evasive until they decide that it's time to leave. And they go from hovering slowly or moving very slowly to uh, there was one that I read about the other night. This was information from a NASA contractor who talked about an intrusion into the radar grid around the Earth that happened recently by a black triangle that was also witnessed by people on the ground. When the triangle left, it took off at Mach 30, 30 times the speed of sound. This is an actual photo of one of the triangles. It, the sighting at the Vainucci that I was present at, one of the things, it never made a sound. It never made a sound. You could, just couldn't hear it. You could see it, and it never made any sound. This just shows you a, our magazine for our organization, the MUFON U, UFO Journal. Every month they have important information on UFO cases. Now, this is a little hard to make out, but this is an actual drawing 
that was done by some people who live outside of Shelton, Washington. In December of 1988, their entire family saw a formation of three triangles, boomerang shapes, they thought, go over their house. They had a sense that they were underneath something very massive and very solid, and it made an enormous electrical hum. There was no ground effect, and when the lead object went over their house, it was shining a searchlight of some sort down onto the ground. And it makes it really interesting when we talk about local people, place, people and places that we, we can relate to, you know, living in exactly. this area. And, um, well, we have an important UFO heritage right here in the Northwest. And everybody in this family drew me pictures. Mm -hmm. This is the wife's picture of the same diagram, the same craft. Uh, the, excuse oh, me, and, and for the friends in Anchorage, uh, Shelton, Washington is uh, how far east would you say of? It's probably. Of Olympia? It's north and west of Olympia, oh. I believe. Yeah, I am backwards again. I was I was going east as usual. I'm just. I'd say <laughs> I, I believe about thirty miles, thirty some miles, yeah. approximately. That's where Shelton, Washington is located. My own area down in Grays Harbor County, November 25th, 1979, I investigated a crash retrieval case. And this is the actual headline from the Aberdeen Daily World, UFO wreckage in Elk River from November 25th, 1979. It stopped traffic in both directions on the Elk River Bridge. One man went hysterical and drove to the local police station in Westport. This is the second newspaper story, Air Force interested in UFO. And there was a final newspaper story, search called off for UFO. I went back and interviewed all of these people who saw this object coming down, and that was just part one of the story. The second part were all of the witnesses, many of whom were in law enforcement, who actually saw the military come down and seal off the logging roads. One man, who is now a logging executive, almost got into a fist fight with two soldiers who kept him from going to work that day. He didn't know anything about UFOs, couldn't care less about something crashing, but he just wanted to go to work. And the soldier said, oh no, we're doing maneuvers here. What's well, interesting, how often does the Army come down and do maneuvers on private property? I've met some of those people uh, under other circumstances and that, that came up. This is an artist's reproduction from a famous case in Pirassununga, Sao Paulo, Brazil and a man named Tiago Machado reported being injured by a beam of light. There were also associated mysterious power failures. These are pictures of the actual ground impression marks that were located by government officials who went out to investigate this very